Hello and welcome back to the Karma Stories Podcast. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today I have three stories for you from the Tales from Tech Support subreddit. The Karma Stories Podcast is published to all major podcasting platforms and you can also read along on YouTube under our at Karma Stories Podcast handle. If you have a story you'd like to submit to the podcast, you can do so by email at karmastoriespod at gmail.com. All right, on to today's stories. Let's get our nerd on. This story comes to us from Superbad64. Unemployment office does not computer. For a bit of context, I left my job in early June due to what I will charitably call major disagreements about remuneration. I've then signed up to the local unemployment office. After scrambling to find the login info I used for the last time about four years and two computers ago. Curse me for not saving that to the cloud. Sarcasm. Anyway, summer being what it is, job postings are very sparse. So I spend most of my time doing other things. Drone is the job counselor assigned to my case. Incidentally, she happened to be on vacation herself when I signed up. So my first few mails were met with automated responses. Unfortunately for me, she's also in charge of approving my unemployment benefits. So let's just say I got my July payment somewhere around the middle of August. One of the conditions to receive unemployment is to not reject more than two offers per month without cause. Said cause can be almost anything reasonable, like the commute being too long, the pay not being enough, basically a bunch of somewhat logical reasons to reject a job. Note that you can cheat the system and just apply and present yourself as the most unhirable person ever and this won't count against you. The unemployment office does not have access to the end result of interviews. But I digress. One morning, I received several calls from Drone, who is back from vacation with a fire burning in her heart and the equivalent of a heat-based death ray directed at me. I noticed you have rejected the offer from Company 1. I'm calling to tell you this is your first warning. Company 1 posted, as far as I can tell, a decent offer, if a little low on the simoleons. The one problem and reason why I declined is that their infrastructure is 100% Windows Server based. I try to position myself as a Linux guy. I need to have, at the very least, equal parts Linux and Windows Server to not have this job negatively affect my career path. And if you think I'm overreacting to this, I still get calls from hardware companies that saw I made one Arduino project 10 years ago on some crusty old godforsaken version of my resume. The last Windows Server version I interacted with was 2012. I likely cannot use anything past 2016 without a refresher course. I proceed to explain the above to Drone, but Drone isn't a computer person. I don't understand how, and I don't need to. One more infraction and your unemployment will be suspended. I was annoyed as F to be the Karen for once. Put me through to your manager now. Bad move. Turns out manager is even worse. Who'd have thought? You would think me quitting because I tried to talk to the lizard folk in the first place would teach me something, but no. I explained the same situation to her, and her answer is somehow even worse. Drone is right, and actually, I think you're being difficult on purpose. The F do you mean difficult on purpose? We have sent you more than one reasonable offer for someone with your experience. You declined Company 2's very competitive offer. I interrupted her. Company 2's opening is for an e-waste sorter. Note, I'm not entirely sure how to translate this. Sorting electronic waste before processing and potentially shipping it out to specialized recycling plants. Yes, so it's in line with your computer skills, right? Absolutely not. I operate computers. My role in their decommissioning usually stops at the recycling center's gates. But a job is a job. The terms are pretty clear. I need to have a valid cause for rejecting a job. The job literally not being anywhere near close to what I have ever done should be a valid enough cause. All I'm seeing is that you're not willing to work, so I will have to suspend your benefits. I really lost it at this point. Listen carefully to me. This isn't my job. I do not work in recycling. But it's computers. This went on a loop for much longer time than it really should have. At some point, I started asking for anybody with more computer literacy in the building. Hopefully someone specialized in IT recruiting. Heck, at this point, I'd have talked to a potted plant if it put manager out of my non-existent hair for a minute. 
Apparently, my local unemployment office doesn't have a recruiter specialized in IT. Despite being located in the middle of an office district known to abduct entire classes worth of graduates every fall. 21st century my shiny metal butt. Ended up having to call the national unemployment office and wait for an hour to have a five minute conversation with an IT specialist that acted like he will schedule training for drone and manager. I'm off the hook for now, but I don't know how long that will last. Addendum, just in case you're curious about some details, manager is at least 60, possibly closer to 70. There were a total of eight companies so far, most of whom I rejected for being fully on Windows Server. Company two above, and one that was located downtown, which is pretty much exactly the area I'm trying to get the heck away from, and literally my old workplace. At least they didn't question that one. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called High Lord Fox. It says, you need to frame it to be something they do understand. Ask them if they know the difference between a surgeon and a veterinarian. If they say yes, then ask them if they think a brain surgeon job offer from the local hospital would be appropriate for a vet to accept. If they say no, go, but they're both medical professionals. That sort of makes people think and maybe get it a little bit that you're a horse computer doctor, not a people computer doctor. At least that's what I do. I tend to make medical professional comparisons and about half the time people understand a little better. Another commenter called Steeljaw72 said, if all your job options are for Windows, maybe it's time to shift over to a Windows career path. OP responded to this one and said, I think there's a bit of confusion about how I brought this up in the original post. So here's an attempt at clearing it. The unemployment office automatically forwards postings that it thinks I'd be a good fit for, based on content, tags, and a whole bunch of stuff. It's those offers that I need to decline with a good cause. The bot, for lack of a better word, isn't and probably cannot be made specialized enough to care about things like specialization. If I were, say, a network tech, it would still push offers to be a COBOL developer to me because all it's really programmed to see is computer terms. But the problem here isn't even the bot, it's the humans acting like every computer nerd out there is largely interchangeable. The company one job I can sort of understand, it's still system administration, just a version thereof I don't feel capable of performing to a satisfactory degree in a professional environment. The company two posting, however, I have no idea. One additional parameter that I deem to not be relevant to the story is that the unemployment office isn't the only source of jobs. LinkedIn, for example, and I do have interviews for a bunch of Linux-centric jobs lined up. But since they are outside the unemployment office's system, they don't count for the purpose of the two strikes. Okay, so if that's the case and OP can prove to the unemployment office that they have interviews through other companies, regardless of whether they're through the unemployment office or not, then I think they should take that into consideration. In fact, I believe that's exactly how it works where I live in Ontario, Canada. As a funny little side story to this one, I myself went to a temp agency at one point many, many years ago, and they offered me a job at the local recycling center, which I took because a job was a job and I needed money. And you'd actually be surprised how many really interesting things get into the recycling from major corporations that would come into this recycling center. I got magazines and money, there was all kinds of stuff. It was pretty interesting. This story comes to us from Chocolate Bourbon. Don't worry, we're fixing it. We'll bother you only if we absolutely have to. About four months ago, I built a report generation process for one of our teams here. They had a process of informal copying and pasting data from a few sources and then use some ad hoc pivot tables combined with manually aggregating the data. They did this every month. It took two weeks each time. Absurd. So I built something for them that auto pulls from the data sources, generates some standardized reports, creates a relational database from those reports, and then generates a massive table the end users can query at their whim. Team members have to prod it at two spots to configure some filters according to the current whims of the business, but the routine takes about 10 minutes. It worked great and they were thrilled with the result. At the end of this, I asked them to please call me if they wanted any changes. Like everything I make, it's built with fairly common tools we use in the business. They could make changes, 
but they seemed to lack the necessary expertise. They would just muck it up, probably. I was very polite but direct. Please let me make any changes. I'm happy to do so. Anywho, I got a call last week. One of the team members told me that the query results were nonsensical. They were filled with errors or just random gibberish. They asked a couple basic questions. Then they assured me that they were working on it and the team would only pull me in if necessary. Oh no, 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 no. But it's probably too late now. They did eventually pull me in. A discussion with the team revealed what happened. Someone on the team had made a change to one of the input tables. I had set up the process to automatically accommodate some changes, but not the structural changes they made. Someone else on the team saw an error in the reports, so they made a couple changes to the report generation process to compensate. And then, someone else saw errors in the resulting table, so they made changes there to compensate. Then, they started talking amongst themselves and began trying to fix it all, which failed, resulting in more grubby hands poking here and there. The result is a haphazard mess. I started this afternoon carefully backing out every change they made, working backwards. But based upon what I'm seeing, I will probably just revert everything to my last edit, eliminating everything they did. None of it had any value. They must have spent hours trying to fix this. At least. I could have made whatever changes they wanted, probably in 10 to 15 minutes. Now I'm going to have to carefully message back to them how I repaired this. I need to strike the appropriate level of frustration so they hopefully take me seriously while I also avoid making them feel stupid. I don't want them complaining to their manager. And I will again ask them to please contact me if they want any changes. Please contact me. It's no trouble at all. Believe me. OP added an update down at the bottom. It says update. It turned out the original error was because one particular field in one particular record had a few dozen paragraphs full of extraneous HTML formatted text. Once I backed out all of their changes and they pruned that one field, everything went back to working flawlessly as it did before. I also offered to explain to my eager beaver end user how to modify aspects themselves. She hasn't accepted yet, but I think she will soon. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called TechGuru8. It says, I know you probably can't, but it would be better to just lock it down to prevent them from breaking it again. Because they will break it again, it's just a matter of time. OP responded to this one and said, Really, it's one person who's enthusiastic about learning how to do this so she doesn't have to bother me. She was the driving force here. Teach someone to fish rather than giving them a fish, etc. I hope she's learned her lesson. If I remove her ability to make changes, that would be bad, but maybe necessary, I guess. Another user down below called Wing in Vegas said, While I get that you are concerned about them involving their manager, I vote a preemptive notice to your manager and theirs, listing out that while technically they can make some changes, it would be better to keep anything outside of the filters you built be done by you to avoid their team having to spend a great deal of time working on structural changes that you are better suited to handle. Aren't these users the best kind of users? You know, the ones that keep poking things and just hoping that maybe if I poke it more, it'll eventually start to work. At least more than one person took a poke at it so they can all sit in shame together instead of it just being one person that everybody is harping on. This story comes to us from Bag of Wisdom. When a problem is a priority for the customer, but not enough to assign capable IT personnel to it. So my company made a hardware revision to one of our products. Unfortunately, that revision revealed a nasty bug in the embedded software for the device. Let's just say a handful of units shipped in a state where they won't connect to a network after being left on for more than five minutes. It took a few returned units to our reliability engineer, but we found the root cause. The fix was a less than 500 kilobyte firmware update. Easy peasy to upgrade. So I get roped into an escalation call. I get called in. Managers above my pay grade are called in. This is a five alarm fire to a bunch of non-technical people. Customer is fuming. They have a bunch of these devices that don't work. I am in this call for less than two minutes and say, what firmware are these units on? 
customer comes back with the older version with this bug. I say, we fixed this in the latest firmware upgrade. I apologize my field tech didn't catch this when they did your implementation. Let me get that firmware file to you with instructions on how to install it. Noting to myself later on that I need to lecture my team again to always upgrade the firmware. Customer successfully gets 8 out of the 9 affected devices upgraded. Number 7 is giving us a little difficulty. The IT person assigned to this task couldn't connect to the web UI to complete the upgrade. It happens, sometimes the IP address isn't what we think it is, and this customer opted for DHCP with no reservation. I told them to just reset the device to factory defaults using the reset button. I provided the default static IP that comes up after a reset. I then got an email from the IT person doing this project. I can't connect to that default IP either. Since this customer is acting as remote hands for me, I make sure I'm dealing with someone that can at least spell TCP IP. Are you on the same layer 2 network as the device and assigned an address on your PC that's in the same subnet as the device? Customer comes back that they are remoted into their laptop, which should be on that network, then proceeds to whinge about the other stations working fine. Great, I got the intern. I explain why they could get to the others, but not this one that we've reset to factory defaults. Then I can't do it. I further explain that someone will physically need to be at the location to connect to that device to bring it back online. Could our product team have made DHCP as the default? Yes, but I'll tell you why a static default IP is easier. When I have 30 plus of these devices that need configuration, usually a simple set it once and never touch it again, it is more convenient for me to just patch straight in with my laptop and just keep the same IP address in my browser window. The web UI does firmware upgrades and configures the device along with assigning it to the customer. Once they're set up, they rarely get touched again until something mechanically breaks down. At this point, I'm ready to tell the project manager to just send the customer another unit. I have 20 people I have to ride herd on and I don't have time to train customer interns. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Mercury Green. It says, they probably assigned their smartest computer guy instead of hiring an actual computer guy. I approve of devices having default IP addresses and passwords after a hard reset. Makes it easier to find it without having to trace down what address a headless client is. OP responded to this one and said, cases can be made either way. Since my techs have to touch them to assign them to the customer and upgrade firmware, Static default IP works best for us. When I was still going in the field, I could get a device ready to go in about 3 minutes. Once a customer is deployed, they get any warranty replacements ready to go out of the box. So OP had to deal with a 5 alarm customer crisis only to realize that they assigned the IT equivalent of a substitute gym teacher to handle it. Yep, no problem, I'll walk your computer expert through the basic networking to get this fixed. Fun. If you enjoy daily Reddit stories, I encourage you to follow and add us to your favorites on whichever podcasting platform you enjoy the most. And if you're watching and listening on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button and drop a like on the video. It really helps us out. I thank you for watching and listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.